to AMC Live, and today's special guest is Ambassador James Sullivan, the U.S. Ambassador to the Russian Federation. And before we start, I did want to remind you that we received over 200 questions, so we cannot answer them all today, but we will answer your questions at a later time, including several questions about visas and our operating status and how to travel to the U.S. Without further ado, Ambassador Sullivan. Thank you, John, uh, and thanks to all of you for joining me today for this special occasion. I've been in Russia for three months now as U.S. Ambassador, and I'm very much enjoying my time here. Uh, I have a newfound love of Palmeni, and I've had the chance to experience warm Russian hospitality. I look forward to exploring more of Moscow and of the whole country in uh, the months and years to come. Before I start our discussion today, I'd like to take a moment to say that the COVID-19 pandemic is of great concern to us here at the U.S. Embassy and in the United States government. We had to close the AMC, this wonderful place, for public programming out of an abundance of caution to prevent any potential spreading of the virus. We want all of our patrons and all of my colleagues to be protected. We look forward to the day when we can welcome everyone back to the AMC and we can return to our lives as they were before. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and your families. Uh, stay safe and practice all of the uh, best practices that we've been, uh, we've been told. I know in this time of great difficulty, it can help to come together and to take care of each other. I've heard many stories of Americans back home, in my home, who are taking care of sick and elderly members of their communities. And I know Russians are wonderful people and, will, and are doing the same here. In this struggle, we as Russians and Americans can collaborate and find support and solution for our common problems, and in particular, this terrible virus. So with that, I'd like to uh, start answering your questions and, uh, and begin a dialogue. Thank you, sir. Let's start with some personal questions. Jelena asks, what kind of coffee do you like, and do you add milk to your coffee? Well, my, uh, my coffee preference really de uh, is based on where I come from. I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, which is in uh, New England in the northeastern United States. In Boston, and in particular a suburb of Boston, Quincy, Massachusetts, is where a famous uh, coffee shop was established in the mid-1950s called Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, and as a good Bostonian, I'm a huge fan of Dunkin' Donuts coffee. It's my favorite coffee. Uh, I drink it black, no cream, no milk, no sugar, no sweetener. Uh, but that's my, uh, my favorite drink in the morning. Thank you. Jordy asked, have you ever dreamed of making a business idea into a reality? And what was your idea? Well, uh, in addition to serving in government, and I, I've served in government now in a number of different capacities over the last 35 years, I've also had a separate career in the private sector as a practicing lawyer, as a member of a law firm, a private organization that is a, a for-profit entity. Uh, and working in the private sector is, is much different from working in government. Uh, in many ways, the market is is uh, is more unforgiving than uh, uh, than politics uh, or government service. Uh, if your services aren't valued, the market will judge you appropriately, and uh, you won't stay in business long. So it's a very hard thing to do, uh, and I respect those uh, those entrepreneurs in the United States and in Russia and elsewhere who've been able to uh, come up with an idea for a business, whether it was a, a service or a good that it would be, would be popular, uh, and they're able to turn that into a uh, profit-making enterprise. It's a, uh, it's a big challenge, requires focusing on your customers, what they want. If you're a service provider, as I was, a lawyer, making sure that my clients were, uh, were well serviced by me and my law firm. And if we didn't, uh, in the marketplace, those clients could go somewhere else and hire another law firm. So it's a big challenge, and, uh, but it's what makes uh, the private sector and the capitalist system work. So I'm very proud of it. Thank you. Luba asks, was there anyone in your childhood who encouraged you to become a diplomat? 
Yes, in fact, in my family, uh, I've had both my father and my uncle, uh, uh, my father and his brother, uh, both served in the U.S. military and uh, during World War II. And then uh, my father continued his service in the U.S. Navy after World War II. But his brother, my uncle Bill, uh, joined the U.S. Foreign Service uh, and had a 32-year career as a diplomat. He was a U.S. ambassador in three different countries, in, uh, in Laos, in Southeast Asia, uh, in the Philippines. Uh, and then finally, he was the last U.S. ambassador to Iran. Uh, he and his wife and my cousins lived in Tehran in the late 1970s. Uh, and he was really the, uh, his career was really the inspiration for, uh, for where I find myself today. Speaking of your family, Galena asked, could you tell us a bit more about your family and did your family arrive with you in Moscow? They did arrive with me in Moscow, at least part of my family. My wife Grace and my eldest son Jack uh, came with me when I arrived in mid-January. Uh, my wife is a partner, a senior partner in a large international law firm. We actually met when we were in law school uh, almost exactly 35 years ago uh, in March of 1985. We were law students at Columbia Law School in New York. Uh, she's had an enormously successful career as a partner in a, a large global law firm. Um, she came with me uh, along with our eldest son, Jack, who is a student, a business school student. Uh, they stayed with me for a time when I first arrived, but my wife had to uh, return to her uh, law practice. Uh, our plan was for Grace and my kids, my children, who are all in their, uh, in their mid to late 20s and either in school or working, for them to come visit me uh, as time allowed. Um, but unfortunately, the COVID-19 virus and the limits on travel are going to restrict their ability to, to come and stay with me until sometime later this spring, I hope. Okay, sir, we're going to move on to culture and travel. Alexi asks, have you had the chance to travel in Russia? If so, what impressed you the most? I have had the chance to travel in Russia. Uh, in fact, my travel in Russia began 32 years ago. Uh, my first trip my first trip outside of the United States was uh, to the Soviet Union in 1988. Uh, and I visited, among other places, Moscow and what was then Leningrad. Uh, so my, my interest in Russian culture, Russian history is longstanding. Uh, in my brief tenure as ambassador, I made my first trip outside of Moscow to Yekaterinburg. Uh, a couple of weeks ago to visit our uh, outstanding consulate there. What's most impressed me uh, as a person of faith uh, are the beautiful cathedrals in Moscow, in, in St. Petersburg, in Yekaterinburg. Uh, I really enjoy uh, learning their history and admiring their, uh, their beauty. Okay, Anya asks, what did you enjoy most in Russia and in the United States? What are your favorite things about both places? Well, uh, I think the thing that unites, uh, and from my perspective, uh, Americans and Russians uh, is ice hockey. Uh, I'm a huge hockey fan, have been since I was a child growing up in Boston. And I've had the, uh, the great privilege of watching uh, a, a, uh, the greatest hockey player uh, in the world today, Alexander Ovechkin, play for my hometown, Washington, capitals and uh, I've said this many times the United the people of the United States are very grateful to the people of Russia uh, for sharing such a uh, great talent with us I know he's very proud of uh, of his Russian roots his Russian family his history of playing for the Russian national team and for Moscow Dynamo uh, but when I think of Russia and the United States and our mutual interest my first thought turns to ice hockey expectations, Nellie asked, what was your worst expectation about Russia, which turned out to be a pleasant surprise for you upon <laughs> arrival? Wow, uh, that's a tough one. Um, well, my first concern was I, I've not had uh, the opportunity to study the Russian language, uh, and I was concerned that I would find, uh, find some challenges in communicating 
uh, with, uh, with Russians here in Moscow or elsewhere. But what I've found is that um, as a very, Moscow is a cosmopolitan city and Russians is highly educated cosmopolitan people. Uh, many speak English and it hasn't been the challenge that I thought it would be. And it, that's also because of the warmth and, and hospitality of the, uh, the Russian people. One other thing I might add, I was warned about Russian winters. Uh, as a New Englander, I like to think of myself as someone who is uh, not, not afraid of cold weather and snow and ice. And so I was prepared for that. But from my arrival in mid-January until today, the weather here in Moscow has been, uh, has been just great. And in fact, on many days, uh, the, uh, the high temperature here in Moscow uh, it has been higher than the high temperature back uh, where I'm from in Washington, D.C. Let's move on to foreign policy questions. Katarina asks, do you believe that there will be a time when Russia and the United States will become real allies? Well, certainly that's the aspiration of any diplomat, any ambassador on behalf of a country representing that country's interests uh, in, a, in a great nation like Russia, is to draw those two nations together. Unfortunately, it's the case, as many have said, that the relationship between the United States and Russia uh, has really reached a low point in the post-Cold War era. My charge as ambassador from U.S. ambassador from President Trump is to do all I can to try to improve that relationship. Our ultimate aspiration would be to have a, a much closer relationship with Russia, but there are many, many issues that divide us that we need to, uh, to work on, and that is a, uh, the, uh, the question is a good one and a, and a hopeful one, but it's a, uh, an, it, it is an aspiration in the future, and we need to take baby steps now to try to improve our relationship. And I would add that my, the reception that I have received in the three months that I've been here from the Russian government uh, indicates that Russian leaders from President Putin on down are interested in, in improving uh, relations with the United States. I have been uh, warmly received by every government official that I've asked to meet with. Uh, and so I would have to say it's been a, uh, it's been a good start to my tenure as ambassador, but there's a lot of work to do and a lot of, uh, of challenges and deep differences that we're going to have to uh, work to overcome over time. Speaking of those challenges, Dennis asked, what steps do you think are important and should be taken to improve bilateral relations between Russia and the United States? Well, I've started working on those issues now. At a minimum, we need to stabilize our diplomatic uh, relationship, the, the, our presence here in, uh, in Russia. We have uh, an, an embassy and two consulates. Because of the COVID-19 virus, we've had to temporarily suspend our operations that are a consulate in Vladivostok. But um, we've had to close our consulate in St. Petersburg. Similarly, the Russian uh, diplomatic presence in the United States has shrunk. We're working hard now with the Russian Foreign Ministry to try to stabilize that diplomatic relationship and restore it to uh, the level it should be at. All right, speaking of the United States, we'll ask some specific questions about our home country. Valeria asks, why is New York City not the capital of the United States? Good question. Uh, New York is the largest city in the United States and an international hub for for finance, for the arts, entertainment. I lived in New York City for a number of years. I met my wife there in the mid-1980s when we were law students at, uh, at Columbia. And in fact, New York was, in the early history of the United States, uh, the original capital uh, of the, uh, our fledgling republic. Uh, for political and geographic reasons, it, uh, the capital gradually moved south first to Philadelphia and then ultimately to Washington, a new city uh, created on the border of Virginia and, uh, and Maryland for political and geographic reasons. Uh, new York is what is sometimes referred to as a queen city. I don't know if that concept exists here in Russia, but in the United States, 
in our in a in our states we have 50 states if the capital of a state is not the largest city in the state uh, the largest city is referred to as a queen city uh, New York is not only the queen city for the United States generally but it's also not the capital of New York State Albany is so New York is uh, is a queen city not the capital of New York and not the capital of the United States but if you ask any New Yorker uh, he or she would say it's the it's the capital of the world and it's hard to disagree okay, thank you Daniel asks, what is the U.S. policy on creating an accessible environment for persons with disabilities? And how are the rights of persons with disabilities protected? And he also asks specifically, how do blind athletes compete in sports in the United States? Great question. Um, it's been a, a, a goal of the United States government uh, to open doors and opportunities for Americans with disabilities. 30 years ago, the United States Congress passed a statute which my former boss, George H.W. Bush, signed into law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, to make it possible for Americans with disabilities, physical disabilities, blindness, et cetera, uh, to enable them to uh, achieve all that they can uh, as, as their talent allows, whether it's in the arts, in sports, in business. Um, and in sports, we've seen this with the Special Olympics over decades. Uh, great athletes competing uh, and uh, achieving great things. I know that there are runners who uh, run marathons. I happen to be a runner myself. Uh, and blind runners uh, are a great feature of, uh, of the marathons that, that I have run. So it's, a, uh, it's something that I'm proud of as an American, that our government and our people have made such, uh, such an effort and a, uh, one that is a, uh, was long overdue, uh, but to, uh, to bring um, all Americans, no matter what their physical limitations, uh, to their, their highest potential. Question about the embassy, and um, a viewer is wondering: Is there a chance the embassy will be open by the summer? Well, the embassy is open now. Uh, we are open for business. We've had to limit it. We've had to limit services, particularly uh, routine consular services, uh, in part, be in large part, because we need to stop. Uh, the spread of the COVID-19 virus, both to protect Americans and Russians. So the embassy and our consulate in, Vlad in excuse me, in Ekaterinburg are open, are open for business, uh, but we have limited services. Uh, I'm coming to work every day. Uh, we have instituted some procedures so that we've have, we have uh, staff who have, uh, are teleworking, uh, and we have limited services, uh, particularly consular services, but the embassy is open and the consulate in Yekaterinburg is open and will stay open. Sir, and another question was, will uh, Russians be able to visit the United States this summer? Uh, inshallah, I hope so. Uh, we'll have to see how the virus progresses. I know the president is eager to get uh, America back to work and Americans back out living their lives. And I know Russians feel the same way. But the most important thing is to keep everyone safe, to do all that we need to do now, uh, to protect ourselves, to practice uh, social distancing, washing our hands, etc., staying indoors, following the guidance of our governments and our medical professionals. And when it's safe, and, uh, and the medical professionals say it's the right time, we'll be back uh, and uh, having Russians visit the United States and Americans visit Russia. And I hope that's as soon as possible. Thank you. This next question is on World War II. Alexei asks, what do you know about the 75th anniversary of the Great Victory Day at Russia on the 9th of May, 2020? Well, I, it, it is, uh, it's a great day for Russia. It's a great day for the United States, uh, for the United Kingdom, uh, for the allies who won uh, a hard-fought and enormously costly victory in World War II. Uh, my father, his brother, uh, served in the U.S. military, in the U.S. Navy during World War II. 
my, my uncle served on a destroyer, and his destroyer was first on duty in the Atlantic uh, protecting convoys, including convoys going to the Soviet Union, uh, and subsequently at the invasion of, uh, of Normandy on, uh, on D-Day, June 6, 1944. Um, that, his ship, the USS Hamilton, later transited the Panama Canal, and he served in the Pacific Theater as well. He was at the invasion of Okinawa. Uh, providing support for the, uh, the U.S. Army and Marines who captured Okinawa. And then his destroyer was one of the first uh, into Tokyo Harbor, uh, in leading uh, the U.S. flotilla in after our victory over, over Japan. My father served in the U.S. submarine service in the Pacific, and he was only in the Pacific theater. So I have a personal history from my family of their service during World War II. I am intimately familiar with the great sacrifices that were made by the, the peoples of the Soviet Union, by the Russian people uh, in defeating Nazi Germany. It was, a, it was a great but horrific and costly triumph by allies over Germany and Japan and Italy. Uh, we did so as allies, and I hope we're able to celebrate as allies. We in the United States celebrate what we call Victory in Europe Day, VE Day, uh, on May 8th. Uh, I'm aware of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the celebration here over the years, and including this coming May 9th, uh, for victory in the war against, uh, against Germany. We also celebrate what we call VJ Day uh, in the United States, celebrating the Allied victory over Japan, uh, which, which ultimately culminated in the signing of a, uh, an instrument of surrender by uh, the Empire of Japan on the battleship USS Missouri, which was presented to uh, General Douglas MacArthur. Uh, so we have a lot of things to celebrate and remember over the next several months. And uh, I'm looking forward to being a participant uh, in those, here, those activities here in Russia. Thank you, sir. And our last question comes from Alessia, who asks, what do you like most about being American? Wow. Uh, I love being an American. Uh, I'm very proud of my country. I'm proud to be the United States, the president's representative here to the great country of Russia. What do I love most about America? Um, I guess uh, speaking as a lawyer, someone trained in the law, um, the United States is a, is a young country, uh, culturally, historically, uh, but our government is relatively old. Uh, we adopted our constitution in seven, and, and our system of government, our constitutional republic, in 1789. Uh, and there are a lot of countries that have had multiple forms of government in the, the centuries since our government was established. I'm most proud of our constitution, of our system of government, which has proved resilient over many, many tumultuous events in uh, over the 230 some odd years of, of the existence of our, our nation, whether it was a, a civil war in the 1860s, the Great War in uh, 1914 to 18, the Second World War, uh, or COVID-19. Our democracy, our constitution has proven resilient, and I'm most proud of that. And uh, I am uh, a, uh, a, a proud American, and I'm proud to be here in Russia representing the United States and engaging with the, uh, the great Russian people. So thank you for, uh, for asking all those uh, terrific questions, and I look forward to uh, continuing my discussions with, uh, with the Russian people.